Hello, my lovely Sangha. Um, for those of you that know me, and for those that do you do not know me, my name is Reverend Jeremy Songdo Williams. I am a novice Zen priest in the Five Mountains in Order. And as a final project in a class I took on Hawaiian Buddhism, I came up with this uh, Dharma talk. And my lovely wife, this past weekend, surprised me because my um, Sangha meeting this past Sunday was actually on my birthday and she surprised me with her first ever Dharma talk. And it was one of the coolest uh, uh, birthday presents that I ever received. So I postponed my <laughs> final presentation to my actual Sangha, at least in the group meeting, and I needed to record it anyway. So I decided to record it at home and I will present it on YouTube and post it on our uh, web page and um, Facebook page for our Sangha's enjoyment. Um, like I said, this class that I took this past quarter was um, based upon a book, book by Francis H. Cook called Wayan Buddhism, The Jewel Net of Indra. This book of some, I think it's 120 rough pages, is basically a condension of this gigantic book known by a couple of names, Abhatamsaka Sutra, or the Flower Ornament Sutra. This document is, to the best of my knowledge, the longest sutra uh, in the Buddhist canon of some, at least as it is translated in this book into English, some 1,518 pages. Quite a read. So I'm going to try to condense it even further today because especially in Zen practice we want the, uh, the crux and core and um, what can we really get out of this to apply in our day-to-day -day lives. So, first of all, I just would like to start out that um, Wayan Buddhism, Wayan literally means the flower garland, um, was a predecessor of Zen and heavily influenced Zen. And Wayan arose in China after Buddhism had already um, began and grown and flourished for quite some time in India. And Buddhism was actually coming into um, China via land and sea routes. And Buddhism had been in China for quite some time as well. And the Chinese were in the process, many of the great Chinese Buddhist thinkers were in the process of trying to um, put together all this uh, information coming from the motherland of, or the birthland of Buddhism of India, and combine it with the local um, belief and uh, philosophical systems of China, which were heavily influenced by Taoism. And it is often said that uh, Yin was almost like if an Indian Buddhist father uh, married a Chinese Taoist mother, and they gave birth to a child called Hua Yin. The Hua Yin founders were trying to come up with a unified theory of Buddhism. They had all these many, many, many teachings and sutras, and they were looking for a teaching that was refined by smelting all the Buddha's vast teachings into a pure gold of one universal teaching. That was one of their main goals. And to do that, um, Wayan had to rework many of the Indian basics and philosophies um, into uh, combinations of the Dallas philosophies. And the typical Indian concepts of big concepts of shunyata, or emptiness, as it's often translated into English, 
from the Indian side in Nargajuna, one of the greatest philosophers, if not the greatest philosopher that ever lived, and certainly one of the greatest, if not greatest philosophers of Buddhist philosophy and thought systems, used a neti neti or a negative, not this, not that, um, structure of um, understanding reality and the universe, not this, not that. And the Yin took the yin and yang um, idea and twisted it around into a more not positive, not necessarily negative being equal to bad and positive being equal to good per se, but more of a positive spin. So instead of an emptiness, a fullness um, of the Buddha's teachings. Um, it's interesting because um, Hua Yin uh, is, funda is fundamentally very differently based um, on different ideas and thoughts than traditional Western ideas. In the traditional Western philosophy and thoughts about the universe, it is a God-created and God-centered universe with a linear idea of time and space, a linear idea of separate individual chunks of time and space as well, with a very definite beginning, middle, and end. There is a definite hierarchy with God being at the top, like a kingdom or even an army. And it is ruled from above, with God ruling at the top, angels, then men in the middle, and then maybe below men are animals and nature. This is a completely different worldview because in this worldview, everything is surrounded and created by God, much like a potter creates a vessel. It is also God commands angels who command, humans who command, animals and nature. And therefore, everything below is subject to whatever creature is above it and whatever its desires are. So nature is here in that worldview to serve mankind, just as mankind is to serve God. With Yin coming from Chinese um, Buddhist-based ideas of the universe, there is no sense of beginning and end. Um, time and space are only created in our mind, and the separation uh, is also created in the mind. A separation of self, a belief in self, and duality. And we, or this mind, creates this separation of time and space into individual units. It's only our delusion, our illusions, um, that create the seemingly uh, the seeming duality and the seeming separate chunks of time and space. In Hua Yin Buddhism, there is no beginning or end. Everything is uh, relative, and it's not linear. All is in the one, and the one is in the all. All things affect everything else. There is no hierarchy in this worldview of Yin. Everything is, everything is just as important as everything else and everything has just as much purpose or meaning or non-purpose and non-meaning in this universe. And one little small change or movement by the smallest individual completely affects the entire universe and vice versa. The entire universe affects the individual. The idea given is known as Indra's net. And this is a beautiful idea. It's a beautiful symbol. And the idea is almost like um, if you went out in the grass in the early morning when the dew was still on the grass. And if you could imagine there was just this enormously huge multi-dimensional um, spider's web going from blade to blade to blade and everywhere as far as you could see and imagine. And at each intersection of the spider web, there was a, a droplet of water, or sometimes they compare it to a jewel. 
and in this droplet of water or jewel was the reflection of every other jewel or water droplet on every other um, intersection of this spider's web. And so you could see the entire web reflected in one drop. And in one drop, you see all the web and all the other drops in this one drop. All in the one and the one in the all. And once again, just like a spider's web, if you shake this one little part because of its connection, it will affect the rest of the web. And we as humans fit into this and are a part of it, are an integral part of it, instead of dominating it, uh, say from the traditional monotheistic view, we must take care of it in order to, to take care of ourselves. Because if we trash it, then it trashes us. Or in other words, if we trash our environment, then we're only making ourselves sick. We're only screwing ourselves, basically. Um, it's interesting because, once again, as these great Indian Buddhist thoughts came into China and the Hua Yin um, founders were trying to get an idea and rework some of these ideas into a universal, unified Buddhist um, thought system, uh, they had some distinct changes but actually just enriched the definitions. One of the biggest is the idea of shunyata or emptiness. Um, emptiness, first of all, let me say, the way they look at it was, it's not a thing to be understood. It's not something that actually exists. It's almost like pure potential. But what I liked about the Yin thoughts on... Um, Sunyata is that it's actually like a tool. It's like a teaching tool, a mental tool, practice. Like a sharp knife that is designed to destroy all dualistic thoughts and philosophies and help rid us of our attachments. It's a wonderful tool. Yet like a sharp knife, it can cut us and harm us unless it is used correctly. So too can an unhealthy attachment or misunderstanding of shunyata harm us if we become attached to it or have an um, unhealthy misunderstanding of it. And what they did was they took this idea of shunyata, um, which was almost the goal of traditional Theravada Buddhism. Once you found this shunyata, this emptiness, you entered into nirvana. And once you were into, entered into nirvana, it was said that you would be released from the cycle of life and death, samsara and nirvana, that you would become Buddha. Therefore, you gained enlightenment and kind of poof, you were gone, off the wheel. No more suffering for you. But with the whole idea of the yin and yang coming from the Chinese Taoist thought system, they reworked this was that the goal was not simply, you know, to find shunyata and therefore nirvana, gain enlightenment and poof, you're gone, you're a Buddha. But that samsara and suffering, this world, is actually just the flip side of the same coin. One side being nirvana, emptiness, bliss, getting off the cycle of life and death, however you want to look at it, with the other side being samsara and suffering in this life, this life of duality. They both exist on the same coin. They cannot be separated. This is a very um, interesting distinction. <clears throat> this also is that plane of existence and non-existence. Form is emptiness and emptiness is form. This also changes the old concept of the Theravadan concept of a, what we would call, a, I always have a hard time saying this, a, a Pratyeka Buddha, or an individual Buddha. 
yeah, that's great for those individuals. Good for you, old Johnny Prakteka Buddha. <laughs> Um, yeah, good for you. You get out of the suffering. You found enlightenment. Poof, you're gone. No more suffering for you. That's great for you, that one individual. But what about the rest of us suckers here? Um, it almost became a term of a derogatory term um, later to call someone a um, Pratyeka Buddha. Um, meant you were basically selfish and you had no compassion or care on other people. But this Mahayana ideal that came out of uh, Yin Buddhism was the ideal of the Bodhisattva. And originally the Bodhisattva just meant someone that was on the way to becoming a Buddha. They were very close. But later this idea of the Bodhisattva was actually someone who, even though they were on their way to full enlightenment, Nirvana, becoming a Buddha, they stopped just short of Nirvana, that complete bliss, that complete enlightenment and stopped just short or in some cases they even said they actually attained it and then came back into this world but either way you see they didn't just poof and they were gone good for them because of their love and compassion for the world they came back to help all other beings um, obtain attain nirvana and enlightenment wake up see clearly, and help save all beings. It's interesting because in a similar um, book that wasn't Buddhist called A Course in Miracles, there was a similar concept that if you don't have duality um, and there is only one being or isness, then if one being attains enlightenment and becomes enlightened and reaches nirvana, then in one sense all beings do. And if even one seeming being is still separate and caught in the world of suffering, how can you say that that entirety has gained enlightenment? So this, even the idea of a, of a separate Buddha, uh, a separate individual who found enlightenment while the rest of us sit here and suffer is almost, once again, part of the illusion. Ultimately, we are all Buddha. And it's just our illusions that um, uh, separate us and make us believe that we are sentient beings versus mundane versus um, supreme beings. Uh, but the, from the book called A Course in Miracles, the idea was that no one um, goes home alone. We all go together holding hands. We all enter the ark two by two. Very interesting thought. Um, although, um, so that being said, um, I just wanted to at least mention a name, Fazang. He was like a founding father of the Yin and often reworked a lot of the Indian Buddhist master and philosopher Nargajuna, which I um, mentioned earlier. Um, he was kind of the father of that. And um, he changed these negative neti neti ideas of emptiness into positive yin yang views. This is because that is. Um, I love the idea that my teacher gave or my instructor gave in this quarter that negative one times negative one equals one. And that's just the same as one times one equals one. We have two negatives making a statement that's equal to two positives making the same statement. Fazayan gave a 10 coin analogy. And the value of coin 10 is dependent on all other coins, one through nine. Without the other nine coins, we wouldn't know the relevance and value of coin 10. And the same can, see, can be said about any other coin, one through nine. We have to have these other coins to know the relevance, relativity, and interdependence. Because if you only have one coin, you have nothing to compare or contrast it to. Um, 
one example I also thought of as well is, say, this red cup. When I hold up this red cup, you know it is red because there are other colors in the spectrum. If everything was one color, say red, then you wouldn't even see this cup. You might see a, you know, maybe a slight line, uh, a delineation around it, but you get my point. Um, this cup is red because of the very existence of other colors and that comparison and um, contrast and the relevance and relativity. In fact, this cup actually, and this is something I was taught in science many years ago that blew my mind, this cup actually isn't even red, if you really think about it. Because the cup is actually absorbing every other color other than red. It's red is being reflected back to you, so therefore you see the cup, you see the red light coming back to you. So the cup itself is actually not red. It's reflecting red and absorbing every other color. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's my red cup um, analogy. And finally, um, the only thing that, that I will read, you know, the last thing that was kind of introduced is the idea of the um, Varakana Buddha uh, is, is introduced and held in very high regard by the Huayan um, practitioners. And the Varakana Buddha is also known by many other names, the Cosmic Buddha, the Primordial um, Buddha, or the Bliss Body of the Historical Buddha. And there's a mudra that, there's many, many different Buddhas, but known as the Universal Buddha, the Ultimate Truth Buddha. And when you see different Buddhas in different statues in many areas of um, Asia, <clears throat> they'll usually be doing different mudras. A mudra is basically just holding your hands in different ways, you know, up and down and pointing fingers and kind of like peace. Uh, we would know this sign or supposedly, I remember a long time ago people were saying this was some symbol of Jesus or victory or whatever, but um, the mudra of um, Varakana is that the right hand holds the left index finger in front of his chest. So if you ever see a Buddhist statue holding a, um, his left finger in his right hand, you can know that that's the Varakana Buddha. And it, what this symbolizes is ultimate truth. And the only two things I'll read out of here are, um, I think, wonderful distinctions of Varakana Buddha versus, say, a monotheistic god. Whatever Varakana is, he is not a god, nor has he any of the functions of a god such as conceived by the main Western monotheistic religions or even Indian religions. He is not the creator of the universe. He does not judge either the living or the dead, nor is he a stern but just father who governs in act the activities of his children. One cannot bargain with Varakana or petition him for special favors since nothing can transgress the law that says what is going to be is going to be. Varakana, like the Tao, is ruthless. It is pointless to pray to him, love him, fear him or flee him. For Varakana is not that sort of being. In short, Varakana is not a god. So there is no question of Hua Yin holding some notion that everything is God. He is not even a he. Varakana is just isness, is just being, literally this entire universe. Varakana is me reading this book your ears hearing the sound of my voice. Hence his name, Varakana, the Buddha of great illumination whose light shines into every corner of the universe. And I'll end this long Dharma talk on Hawaiian Buddhism with this lovely, almost poetic um, line out of this book. <clears throat> Varakana Buddha exists everywhere and every time in the universe. 
and the universe itself is his body. At the same time, the songs of birds, the colors of flowers, the currents of streams, the figures of clouds, all these are the Sermon of Buddha. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Please feel free to um, email me, call me, or bring up questions in class if you have any interest on Hawaiian Buddhism uh, or any of the subjects I brought up today. Like I said, I will post um, links to the two books, uh, Francis Cook's Hawaiian Buddhism, The Jewel Net of Indra. I will post a link to that in association with this video as well as the actual sutra itself, the Abhatamsaka Sutra, in English translated the Flower Ornament or Flower Garland Sutra. Thank you, and peace be with you.